Hey guys, welcome back to another week. Last week I put down the heterorhabditis indica nematodes. They've only been down for a week, but we're going to see is a week long enough to start seeing results with those nematodes as in regard to small hive beetles. Also, I'm trying out a new smoker fuel that it's like a hay or a straw type thing. So we're going to learn if that smoker fuel has been working as good as my hamster bedding that I've been using, these fine wood chips that actually I can keep that smoker running for two hours when I'm out in the field with it. So we're going to take a look at that and see how that does. Stay tuned and I hope you enjoy today's episode. All right guys, look what we got going on here. I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up very well, but you'll see a bunch of bees buzzing around all crazy. And that's them doing an orientation flight. So I noticed that they'll do that whenever I see them doing that for eh, about a half an hour and then they'll kind of settle down and maybe it's just the time that I get home that they've been doing an orientation flight for a while but uh, that's what that is right there so I'm gonna give them a little time to do that but in the meantime I'll show you what my setup is and what I'm working with today so as I mentioned, I'm working with a new smoker fuel. It's this toothy hay. So I'm going to see if that does just as well as the wood chips that I was using. And there's my old bag of wood chips. It's actually used for like guinea pigs and like hamster bedding. It does really good for me. I can fill a smoker with it and I could keep it, that smoker lit for like two hours when I'm out there in the bee yard. And while I'm waiting for the bees to settle down from their orientation flight that they're still doing over there, I'm just going to show you again this nice easy way to fill the beetle traps. This pin holds it for you so you don't have to even do that. These bottles are nice because it, as long as the cap's on, if you knock it over, it won't spill unless you pop the cap off. So you have a lot of control over it. So there's that's apple cider vinegar that I put in, and that seems to work. We've been catching beetles. And then all this is just olive oil that you'd use for cooking. I use extra ol uh, virgin olive oil. And I don't know if it really matters if it's extra virgin or even if it's olive oil, but that's what I use. And it works. So I just stick with what's working. Just making a thin layer of oil there for the beetles. And you can see I was being real quick with it. I did have some drips where I didn't really want it, but it, it's not going to be a disaster. So I'm going to pick that up and show you. And it's as easy as that. Now these traps are just ready to go. And so when I get into the hive, I won't have to put these things on the hive and then fill them and then risk, you know, pouring some on the honeycomb or anything. They're just already pre-made and I'll just put them in there and get good to uh, catch some beetles. All right, guys, so I'm going to try out that, that hay that I got as a smoker fuel. You see the paper I'm using, I tore it in half. You can see how big it is compared to my hand. I'm just going to crumple this up so there's some air pockets so it lights really well and burns well. Starting to catch there. So now I'm just going to shove this hay in there. And I've never worked with this hay, so I'm going to be a little awkward with it. It 
So I'm just shoving more in there. Nice, rich, creamy smoke. throw one more handful in there and yep more because there's a little more space this is because this is the same way I do the wood shavings that they sell as uh, hamster bedding so I'm just trying to see how this hay works compared to that seems to get consumed pretty quickly so you see I keep stuffing more in because it keeps burning pretty quickly I don't want to run out of smoke too soon And then what I like to do is use a little ball of loosely packed paper and stick it in the bell. Which some beekeepers might find a little weird. But what that does is it prevents sparks from flying out at your bees. So I don't have that bell down very tight because it looks like the grass kept the lid open a little bit, but I think that'll work for the bees today. So you'll notice the bell isn't completely sealed down because some of the hay is still in the way, but I think it'll still work for the bees today. Unfortunately, right when I started doing the actual bee maintenance is also when I believe my batteries on my microphone died. So I'm actually dubbing over this video, that's why you don't hear the bees buzzing and all the fun sounds of nature which I think are some of the best parts of this video, of any beekeeping video that I do. So I apologize for that but bear with me while I just dub over what I'm doing here. Here I'm taking off the cover and what I've discovered in the top feeder is that the syrup was basically not even being touched. There was, it looked like pollen floating on the top and it looked kind of slimy so it just didn't look good. 
Uh, my only guess is that the bees didn't need this syrup, so they chose not to drink it, and it kind of went bad. So I already knew that even though I had planned to feed them just for at least one more week because they were still eating as of the last week that I checked on them, I thought, well, they're not feeding this time, so I legitimately am just going to clean out the feeder like I normally do, and then just, uh, I guess, let them feed from nectar and pollen since they don't seem to be interested in, in the uh, sugar syrup. <laughs> when I lifted this feeder off, I believe whenever I broke the front end free at first, I actually spilled some syrup back there. So at this point I just ran back there, rinsed out the feeder, I got a lot of syrup on my hands, and I uh, rinsed my hands off with a garden hose. Uh, during the actual recording of this, I mentioned that that's probably not going to be ideal because then a bunch of bees are going to be like feeding on the sugar and you know, it's just going to be something I have to be more careful about so I don't accidentally crush bees with my fingers and whatnot. Now, before I get into the hive here, I'm smoking my own hands and that's because a lot of beekeepers will say that that actually helps prevent stings. I don't know how true that is, but I figure it doesn't hurt to puff some smoke on my arms and my hands. Here we're just looking at the honey super. And when I looked down into the hive, six of the four frames had some comb developed on them and the other four frames really didn't have much going on. So here I am prying up the one of the outermost frames that still had any comb developed on it. And I'm just going to pull that out and show you guys what's going on there so you can see the progress of the hive. There you see, there's a good portion of capped honey there and a lot of developed comb there. They're starting to fill that frame in pretty well. And they actually have cappings on both sides. Where I believe last week they had some cap on one side, but the other was completely open. And that is the outermost frame that has any comb on it. So that's the least amount of development that is visible in the hive right now as far as the honey super goes. And now it looked like a tie between these two adjacent frames right here. So I just pulled the nearest one toward me that looked like it was dead center of the production. And I just want you guys to see what the strongest comb in the super looks like or at least one of the two because it was really close there wasn't a definite winner with these two in the center here so here I am just picking it up and you could already see this one has a lot of cap stuff going on it's drawn all the way down to the bottom it just needs to go a little bit wider if the bees are going to do that so they're making some progress up there the main thing I noticed is that it's not just six frames of comb like there were last week, but these six frames actually had a pretty good population of bees in them. And that's the key thing, because if we could draw out two more frames and have at least eight of those frames heavily populated with bees, then it would be time to add one more super, which in my opinion would be pretty good for first year beekeeping, because... These bees are drawing everything out from a blank foundation. And if we could get two supers this year, we'll harvest one of them and let the bees have one. 
in my opinion, that would be some pretty good performance for a hive that started from a nucleus and nothing but a bunch of blank foundation. So here I am going to pop off this super here. I commented here during the actual live recording that the propolis doesn't have this hard pop because at this time it's actually a very warm so the propolis is very stretchy and like gooey so whenever I try to pry it up uh, it's actually like re-sticks itself whenever I, if I let it sit too long almost like the bees have some sort of automated propolizing going on there and you can tell I'm wearing my radio, it was working just fine uh, for earlier clips in this video but I guess that was the last bit of battery life it had and that's just a guess, there could actually be some sort of actual problem with the transmitter but I'll have to find out, so that's why I'm dubbing over here in this episode uh, here I am trying to get into the queen excluder, take that off and I'm finding that it's very difficult to pry this thing off because they have a lot of that very sticky propolis and you had to pull it pretty far to really break it free because instead of it breaking free like it would on a cooler day it just stretches so here's where we're gonna find out eventually in this brood box how effective have the Heterobditis indica nematodes been toward a hive beetle control so far? Uh, the instructions say that you have to keep the soil pretty well hydrated for two weeks, consistently watering your grass if you're going to have these nematodes take hold. And since the nematodes only attack the larvae and not the beetles themselves because the larvae will end up in the soil the idea is that it cuts off the life cycle so the next generation of beetles can't go on and then you'll stop seeing beetles ideally so I was wondering in this episode how effective has it been so far can we really expect any results and I'm showing you here that there is about five dead hive beetles in this particular trap and so if you look at last week we had maybe a dozen dead beetles in a trap and I think that was after letting the hive sit for two weeks because the inspector visited the hive on Tuesday and the Thursday before that we opened the hive so since we felt bad for that hive being opened twice in one week we decided it would be a better idea to just leave them go for a couple weeks and let them settle in a bit. So five hive beetles in that one trap is pretty comparable to 12 hive beetles after leaving them for two weeks. So it really doesn't look like there's an improvement in the amount of hive beetles uh, as far as watching them decline. And I wouldn't necessarily expect that anyways because maximum efficacy for nematodes, at least in the literature that I read, is about four weeks till you really see the full impact of the nematodes. So I was hoping, optimistically, that we would see like very few hive beetles in the traps and it would maybe be an indication that there's no hive beetles. But of course that's not the case and it really wasn't expected. Here I am just pulling out a brood frame and looking for the queen because the funny thing was last couple times we did find the queen we found her on these more outer frames on this what would be the right hand side of the hive if you're looking at the entrance of the hive and I always have the idea that the queen's going to be more in the center of the hive though she could be anywhere because of course if she's laying brood out on the outside then yeah she's going to leave eggs there, therefore she's asked, she has to be there. Here I'm just showing you the frame to the best I can. The area is kind of shady so it's hard to get a really good look at them 
but I'm just showing you in the camera and again I'm just kind of guessing where it falls in the viewfinder and I'm putting them down right next to the hive on those cinder blocks leaning them up against the honey super at this point I hadn't seen a whole lot of uh, sealed brood definitely it's hard to spot stick eggs in the shady environment where we have the hive and there was no queen there's actually some honey stored there so here I'm just continuing the search but before I do that I want to remove this very outermost frame just to make more room to work for me this is kind of a new style of freeing the frame I'm sticking the hive to a linen prying it most of the time I like to just use the hook or just use a little twist of the hive tool but in this situation it seemed like it would be a good idea to use that angled prying method and just get some practice with that here you can see this frame basically just doesn't have anything going on there so I'm just putting it down right next to the hive You can tell we have a really well populated hive so far because it's hard to keep the bees away from the top. I have to keep smoking them because they're just so populated that they'll cover the top pretty easily. Here I am angling it out and prying it now that I have space. And just because I didn't bring it up, I'm using the hook just to break it free from the little frame rest. So that when I grab it with my fingers, I don't have to pull up on it super hard and potentially have a disaster. I didn't see the queen in there. There is, if I remember correctly on that frame, was just... Kind of some sparse brood and I'm, I remember feeling a little concerned because I like to see a nice solid brood pattern and with especially what I saw in the water when I took up their uh, top feeder it looked kind of like nasty there was uh, looked like pollen floating on top and I think there was some slimy stuff going on there like as if the pollen and the sugar kind of create like a bacteria or something uh, and so I was kind of concerned about the health of the hive when I saw the way that water looked when I say water I mean the sugar syrup and so so far the brood pattern had been pretty sparse and I was wondering am I gonna see the strong brood pattern I'm seeing some cat brood cells but I'm not seeing larvae and stick eggs and stuff like that haven't seen the queen, is our queen still alive? And so as I get deeper though we're finding more and more populated frames another puff of smoke because we do have a lot of bees running around here and they'll, they'll crowd up on the top and then you have to be careful how you put that tool in because you could uh, potentially crush a bee and you know, get them angry at you On this frame you can see there's a nice solid wall of brood there so that's a good healthy thing to see in the hive. The more sparse frames I'm not too worried about because I did see an orientation earlier today like I was showing you and a lot of bees uh, might have then just hatched out of their cells so a lot of open cells could just be bees that hatched out. I 
think at this point I was getting concerned because, okay, yeah, we see the solid brood, and that's a good sign. Um, but where's the queen? And so I was going to go in one more and see if we could find the queen because that would be nice to see her, though that solid brood pattern was a good thing to see. Alright, and there she is. He's on the bottom, the yellow dot. I don't know if you could see that in the camera, but we did find the queen, and so I was satisfied with that, and I just wanted to put her back, and... Just get on with the rest of the inspection now that we know that the queen is alive and well. Here I'm showing you, there's all these bees crawling around on my hands because, well, I'm grabbing her frames and there's propolis and stuff. Plus there's some of that sugar that dumped out on the back. And I'm just kind of showing you guys all these bees crawling on my hands. being very gradual just really a better idea would have been for me to pick the frame up and put the edges of the frame against each other and slide it down because the way I slid it in like that you could actually squish bees even if you're moving slowly for some reason I see a lot of times the bees will stick their heads between the frames and even though they might feel the frame closing in on them it's, it's almost like they don't expect that to be a possibility or something and then you can end up squishing a bee between the frames and so really it would have been better if I just picked the frame up and then slid it down against the other frame because any bees that were in contact with those contact surfaces would have been brushed off by the sliding motion rather than potentially pinching the bees between the frames Got a bunch of bees crawling all over my hands, and I just I just find that entertaining. So sometimes when I have several bees on my hands, I just like to show you guys. Probably didn't help that I spilled some of that syrup on my hands whenever I was trying to clean it out. Rinsed it off with the hose, but that's not really gonna get it because I didn't have like soap and water with me. So. At one point in this video, whenever I was doing the actual live recording, when a bunch of bees were on my hands, I had already been stung a couple times. I don't think I've been stung yet so far in the video, but sometime in this video I did get stung about three times in my right thumb. And there was times where the bees seemed to be busy feeding on whatever sugar was left over on my hand. And even though I had that venom in my thumb, they didn't bother to sting me in my thumb anymore. My stings came not too frequently. 
today. I got stung once and it was a while until I got a second sting and then I went a while until I got my third sting and then I, I didn't get sting, stung after that but it was all on that thumb. But it was amazing how many bees were all over that thumb and they were too busy eating sugar syrup rather than trying to attack me which in theory they should be attacking me because the venom has an attack pheromone in it and that would mean that if a, a bee senses that attack pheromone even more bees will want to sting that same site and so I have like this little hypothesis that if you have sugar on your hands and the bees are feeding on it the bees that are feeding are too worried about feeding to bother stinging you and I think it might take something like pinching the bee or something to cause that bee to want to sting you at that point when they're feeding I'm adjusting the camera angle here to uh, pry up this frame here and one thing <laughs> this is where I got stung and it was actually right in the pad of my thumb I remember that because of the way I jumped like that I didn't even see it coming and I think I had actually already been stung one time before this because the first time the bee stung me it was I didn't feel it I just saw, I felt this constant buzzing on my hand and looked down and this bee was stuck on my thumb buzzing trying to get away but she was stuck down by her stinger so I didn't even feel the actual sting then I have these tweezers with me that I decided to start using instead of my hive tool because it's more reliable to pull out the stinger at any rate, I've been stung and I didn't even feel that sting, but this time, what you just saw right there, the bee got me like right in the center of the thumb and it stung like alarmingly where it made my hand just retract real quick because it really did sting. And I was like, man, that one hurt. <laughs> I think I remember my exact words were, uh, that stung. And this beetle trap we had another I think it was five beetles if not six so that was about the same as what we had on the other side and like I said this is after a week of checking on them last time where we had about a dozen beetles in one of the traps it was after leaving them for two weeks and then the other trap had a few just a few of them in there here I am re-smoking my hands because now that I've been stung, I believe, twice at this point, I just want to cover up the venom because we have some really nice bees and it just doesn't make sense to have them be more aggressive than they need to be or whatever uh, because my goal is to just keep them calm and move these frames killing as few bees as possible and if they get all angry at me that could be a different story it might be harder to manage them I'm showing you how the bare side of this frame is more in the middle of the hive and that's because the inspector showed us that if we want to encourage growth on some of these frames what we can do is turn the comb side away and expose the bare side to the center of the colony and then it'll encourage them to grow comb and you really couldn't see it in the camera but they did start growing comb and what you saw there just a second ago or so was me just showing you more bees crawling on my hands <laughs> one thing that uh, I like to point out about that is I don't really I don't like to wear gear because it's very un uncomfortable especially in hot weather and I'd rather just develop an immunity to venom to the point that it's not a big deal when I get stung 
And so when you're not wearing gloves, yeah, you'll get stung. But you could also feel the bees on your fingers. And if there's a bee on your finger and you're about to grip a frame, you could prevent from squishing that bee because you actually could feel the bee is there. If you notice the way I put that beetle trap in when I slid it in there, I was kind of gradual, I kind of slid it across and then I let it drop down. And the idea is you want those beetle traps to be flush against the top bar because if they're not flush that gives the beetles another place to hide and that's just not necessary. One thing I'd like to point out, which may or may not mean anything about the efficacy of the H. indica nematodes so far, is that in both previous inspections, when I was moving these frames, I saw beetles running over the tops of the frames and, and ducking out of the way and stuff. I remember that the whole time I was looking through his hive, I did not see one running beetle. Every beetle that we found is the dead beetles in the traps. Where, that's the first time I've seen that. Because before, if I saw beetles in the traps, I also saw beetles running across the frames. So does that mean that the H. indica has already started killing off the larvae and therefore we're not seeing any more new beetles? Uh, we can't really say, we don't know. I put this beetle trap in the wrong location basically and it wasn't until after I slid in that final frame that I realized oh yeah dummy uh, we want these beetle traps on the very outside between the outermost frames on the outside and not you know two frames into the hive because of the nature of how hive beetles work. Basically the bees scare the hive beetles away usually into a corner and in a solid bottom brood box the bees will drive the beetles into a corner and trap them there and even bury them in wax and smother them. So this makes the bees job a lot easier. All they have to do is uh, there I am showing off more bees on my hands so all I have to do is, all the bees have to do is scare the beetles away toward the outside and the trap takes care of the rest. It makes the hive beetles end up uh, just being disposed of a lot quicker and saves the bees the work. And any times the bees have to use propolis and wax to do anything, that's expensive because an uh, interesting statistic is it takes about 8 ounces of wax. I got that backwards. It takes about eight ounces of honey to create one ounce of wax. So it's just a good idea to not have the bees having to work that hard to kill hive beetles. Here I am catching my mistake of putting a beetle trap where it was. And these frames are too tight together for the trap to drop down. So now I have to shift the frames over a little bit. And at this point, I pointed out in a video that in the military, they have an expression called smooth is fast. And that's because it's better just to do things correctly at a comfortable pace and get it done right than do what I'm doing here where I put the trap in and now I have to redo it if I'm going to do it right. And... It's a thing that's really applicable, very relevant for the world of beekeeping because I hear a lot of beekeepers talk about how you know they put timers on themselves and they don't want to spend more than like 20 minutes in their hive or whatever. Um, but some things you just can't rush. Like bees by their nature, you have to be patient with them and move slowly and you know, in a hurry, you could end up creating more work for yourself. And a good example is just that stupid little mistake I made there where I was like, okay, I'm going to put my beetle trap in. And then I realized, oh yeah, duh, we don't have all 10 of our frames in. <laughs> then when I put that last frame in, I realized, okay, so the trap has to move over one more. And that just costed me that much more time where if I would have just done it right the first time, 
I wouldn't be spending what was that maybe two minutes of time just to reposition that trap and here I kind of give up on trying to smoke the bees away from the edges because like I said earlier the hive is so well populated that the bees come up to the top pretty quickly and when it comes to getting all four sides of this box free of bees so that I can put the queen excluder down that's kind of impractical and so uh, even though I did puff it earlier I just saw how quickly those bees came back and I said okay well let's just put this queen excluder on and just try not to kill anybody if we can help it I don't think I succeeded and I believe I crushed a bee or two but you saw how carefully I did that and how I shifted around and moved the bees out of the way the best I could sometimes that's the best you can do if I were working like an actual apiary where they would want me to probably move a lot faster to get these all these hives done on time and all that uh, there'd probably be a lot more bees dying I'm just speculating on that one but I'm assuming that it, there's only so many hours of daylight that you could work the hives and depending on how many hives you got and what kind of manpower you have you might have to move boxes on to the bottom super there a little quicker so as I mentioned before About three weeks ago, the hive inspector told us that we could probably go without feeding them because there's so much pollen and nectar out there right now that they should be fine. But I remember that the inspection after the inspector was there, which was two weeks later, they drank all the syrup completely down to the bottom. So I thought, well, they're not ready for that yet. And then this time around, they didn't really seem to even have touched their syrup. So I don't, I don't really know what's going on with that. Because the syrup did look kind of funky. So I don't know if the syrup went bad. Or if, and that's why the bees weren't drinking it. Or if the syrup was just untouched like the bees didn't bother doing anything with it and that's why it started looking kind of weird is because they weren't consuming it and it was just kind of stagnating there so who knows really what it is but between what the hive inspector said and the amount of syrup that I found which looked like every bit of syrup that we put in there in the first place I'm going to go without the top feeder this time and we'll see how they're doing next week and hopefully we'll see that the bees are still increasing in numbers here I'm just showing you the best look I can with this camera down the frames and unfortunately because of the lighting and everything you're really not getting a good view of all the comb down there but if you want to take my word for it about six of these frames have good comb develop on it and the outer foremost frames are basically blank with maybe just a thin layer of wax that the bees just barely started building on I don't even know why I'm showing you all that stuff with the camera. I'm just having fun there, I suppose, zooming in on a bee so you can get a good look at them in their entrance. You saw my tripod there. It's a Neewer, by the way. If any of you guys are photographers or videographers, 
Uh, Neewer is a pretty good brand. I'll actually link that in the description along with the Sony A6400 camera that I'm using. In case you're interested in videography or photography, I can tell you that that Neewer is pretty affordable and just really good. It, it's very reliable, lightweight, easy to use. I don't have any complaints about that. And here I am just dressing down the hive. I put the inner cover on. And right when I'm about to put this top cover on, I'm pushing this bee around because she's sitting there. But she seems pretty stubborn, so eventually I just give up and get the smoke because I thought maybe I could scare her away by just touching her with my finger. But she really didn't, wasn't having it and just decided to just sit there and move a little bit and just kind of hold or stand her ground. So I didn't want to trap any bees in there since I don't have any escape built into that. As a matter of fact, I put up mesh to prevent robber bees from getting in, but it also prevents our own bees from flying out. And there's our smaller looking hive now that we remove the feeder. But that's a good sign to me because if the bees can get their own food without me having to supplement them with sugar, then that's better than what we can do for them with uh, mixing sugar and water. So there's our nice little shorter beehive now. Alright guys, so see you next week where we'll find out if we're seeing any signs of the H. indica has taken care of our hive beetle issues. And we'll just see how that goes throughout the month. Thanks for watching.